morning, everyone. Amen. It's hard to be in the Lord's house with the Lord's people yeah. on the Lord's day. And uh, I've been blessed already being here. Uh, Jared Sunday school lesson, that was very good. And uh, it's good to see you all. And uh, if you have your Bibles and you'd like to follow with us, we'll be in Matthew chapter 26. <coughs> The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. <laughs> Matthew 26. And we'll, be, we'll read verse 26. Begin reading in verse 26. Matthew 26, 26. <clears throat> And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Amen. So here, Jesus has entered into Jerusalem for the last time before Amen. his death. Yeah. And uh, he's been preparing his disciples for what's about to happen. He's been explaining to them that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And now he and his disciples have come to Jerusalem at the time of Passover. Uh, you see, every Jewish man was required to come to Jerusalem to observe the Passover every year. And Jesus and his disciples were obedient Jews. And so they've come to observe the Passover along with thousands and thousands of their Jewish brethren. And as they're together in a large upper room, Jesus took the unleavened bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. This food, he says, is a symbol of my body, which will shortly be broken for you. And then he took the cup, filled with the fruit of the vine, and gave thanks and gave it to them and said drink ye all of it for this is my blood of the new testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins this drink is a symbol of the blood which in a few hours i will shed for you and he you see he's still teaching them about what's about to happen what he came to accomplish the fulfillment of his life's purpose to bleed and to die for sinners. Yeah. But what does Jesus mean when he says, this is my blood of the New Testament? The New Testament. When we think of the New Testament, what do we think of? Well, we usually think of the last 27 books of the Bible. We call that the New Testament. Uh, but Jesus isn't talking about particular books of Scripture here. The word translated testament here is uh, also translated many other places, covenant. And that's the idea that Jesus has in mind here. Right. This is my blood of the new covenant. Uh, yeah. And that's what we'd like to speak about this morning. The new covenant. So first, we need to ask, what is a covenant? What is a covenant? Simply put, a covenant is a binding agreement. It's kind of a contract between two or more parties. And in a covenant, certain commitments are made. And also, very often, in a covenant, certain tangible, visible signs uh, are given as a reminder of these commitments. So, for example, marriage is a covenant. Uh, we call it a covenant union 
of one man, one woman, for one lifetime. And uh, when I married my wife, Natalie, I promised to remain faithful to her and only to her so long as we both shall live. And she promised the same to me. And we made these commitments to each other. We entered into this binding agreement, this covenant. And the terms of this covenant are very clear, that we're bound to these commitments as long as we both shall live. And not only that, we even have visible signs of this covenant. We gave each other wedding rings. And these rings are a continual reminder to us and to everyone else who sees them of the commitments that have been made in our marriage covenant. Now, something amazing that we see all throughout the Bible is that God makes covenants. Right. God enters into binding agreements with man. We serve a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. For example, one of the earliest covenants uh, we read of is the covenant God made with Noah after the flood. You see, after Noah and his family came off the ark, God said, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you, that neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. You see, God entered into a binding agreement with Noah and his seed and every living creature. And God made promises in this agreement, promises never to destroy all flesh or all the earth by a flood. And we, who are the descendants of Noah, we're still parties to this covenant all these thousands of years later. God has kept his covenant. And not only that, but God even provided a visible sign of this Noahic covenant. God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant right. between me and the earth. The rainbow mm -hmm. is a visible sign of God's covenant with the earth. He says, when I look upon that rainbow, I will remember my covenant. Mm -hmm. It's a continual reminder both to him and to us of the commitments he made in that covenant. And so when Jesus says, this is my blood of the new covenant, he's speaking about a new binding agreement that's being made. A new agreement. A new contract. And so that leads us to this question. What's the new contract? And it also sort of implies this question. What was the old contract? It turns out these questions had already been answered hundreds of years before Jesus Amen. was even born. And indeed, Jesus is here explicitly making reference to what had already been recorded in the book of Jeremiah. So if you have your Bibles, you'd like to turn with this. Turn to Jeremiah. Chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. This is what Jesus is making reference to. <clears throat> Jeremiah 31, we'll begin reading in verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel mm -hmm. and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts 
and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So here, the Lord Jehovah says the days are coming when I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And it's not going to be like the old covenant, but it's going to be so much better. So based on what we've just read, what was the old covenant? Well, God says the old covenant is the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. In other words, there was a particular covenant that God made with the children of Israel when they were coming up out of the land of Egypt. And we find that covenant given in the book of Exodus through the mediation of a man named Moses. So we call that the Mosaic covenant, the covenant that was given through Moses. And we'll have more to say about that Mosaic covenant later. But this is the old covenant that the new covenant is going to replace. And so when Jesus says, this is my blood of the new covenant, he's saying that the time is at hand when that old Mosaic covenant is going to vanish away and a new covenant is going to be brought in, the new covenant. In fact, it's with his blood that the new covenant is going to be established, the blood of Christ himself. Amen. So Jesus is telling his disciples, we're right now standing at the threshold of this great turning point in the whole history of God's relationship to man. That's the idea. And so for the remainder of our time this morning, we're gonna take a closer look at the old covenant and then we'll look at the new covenant and then we'll be done. So first, the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant. Actually, God was already preparing the way for the Mosaic Covenant centuries before Moses was ever born. Uh, all the way back when God dealt with a man named Abram. Abram. And the Lord made so many promises to Abram. Uh, we don't have time to talk about them all. But you'll remember that when Abram and Sarai had no children, God promised that they would have a son. God took Abram out to look at the night sky and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto thy seed have I given this land. And not only that, but God also gave visible signs to Abraham in confirmation of this covenant. God changed this man's name to Abraham, which means the father of a great multitude. And God also gave him the sign of circumcision. Ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. He that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man-child in your generations. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. You see, this sign of circumcision was performed only once on every <coughs> male child. And it marked off a particular people, distinguishing them from the rest of the world. It was a reminder to God and to Abraham, and to his children, and to all the other nations of the covenant promises God made to Abraham. And in time, the promised child was born, and they named him Isaac. And uh, then Isaac's son, Jacob, was born. And God even changed Jacob's name to Israel. And then Israel, and all the children of Israel eventually came down into Egypt. And they survived there. And they even flourished there in Egypt. So much 
that the Egyptians became jealous of them and decided to make their lives bitter with hard bondage. Pharaoh even commanded that all the male Hebrew children should be killed as soon as they were born. But the Hebrew midwives feared God and disobeyed the king and saved the male children alive. And then one day, by the grace of God, Moses was born. And God chose Moses to be the one who would lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. God sent Moses to confront Pharaoh. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. And you know about the plagues that God sent on Egypt. And that final plague was the death of the firstborn, all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And that's when the Lord commanded the children of Israel to take a lamb, a lamb without blemish, one lamb for every house. And they would kill the lamb in the evening and take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house. And they would eat the flesh of this lamb with unleavened bread. Because in this night, the Lord would pass through the land of Egypt to strike all the firstborn in the land. And he said, the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. This was the first Passover, the first Passover. And you see, God made the promise that when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that's exactly what God did. And on the very same day of this Passover, the Lord brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. And not only that, but God also gave this Passover feast to the Jewish people for an ongoing memorial to be observed every year. And this became another visible sign of the promise that God had kept when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. Every year, they would keep the feast and remember what God had done. And this sign of the Passover was actually related to the sign of circumcision. Because we read that God commanded that no uncircumcised person shall eat there. Circumcision must precede the observance of the Passover. You see, there's a particular order of these signs which God specified. Circumcision was a one-time act that marked off a particular people from the rest of the world. And only those who were so marked off were permitted to partake of this feast, which was an ongoing one. You know what? God also specified where this Passover sign was to be observed. In each house of the Israelites. One lamb for each house. And the Lord's very specific on this point. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth all of the flesh of raw out of the house. So this sign of the Passover was not to be observed from house to house, nor anywhere outside the house, but only within each house. And this is how the Jews observe the Passover even to this day. And so the Lord used Moses to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And then he brought Moses up to the Mount of God. And God spoke to the children of Israel through Moses. You see, he was a mediator to go between God and the people. And through Moses, God proposed a covenant to the children of Israel. Moses was the mediator of this covenant. Let's read what the Lord said. Turn, if you would, to Exodus 19. This is what God said when he proposed this covenant to the children of Israel. Exodus 19. And we'll begin reading in verse 4. Exodus 19. 
Exodus 19, 4. <clears throat> Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a an holy nation. What blessed promises. These were the promises of the Mosaic covenant. If you obey my voice, you'll be my peculiar treasure. And you'll be a kingdom of priests. And you'll be a holy nation. But did you notice one very important word in the terms of this covenant? If. If. If you obey my voice. This covenant came with certain requirements. Certain conditions. Conditions which had to be met by the Israelites in order for the promise to go into effect. So we call this a conditional covenant. If. And only if the people obey will they become a holy nation. And what were the people to obey? Well, everything that came in the next four chapters, what we call the law, the law of Moses. And you know what? The people agreed to this law. They agreed to it, uh, that they would obey it. Turn over a few pages to Exodus 24. After Moses reads all these words, Exodus 24, verse 7. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said will we do and be obeyed. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So, God specified all the terms, and the people agreed to these terms, and then the covenant was sealed with blood, with the blood of oxen. So the old covenant was officially ratified by blood. The people made the binding agreement to obey the law of God. And God made a binding agreement that if they obeyed, he would bless them and make them a holy nation. But then what happened? Israel did not obey. <laughs> and by their disobedience, they broke the old covenant. As we read in Jeremiah, the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Of course, God already knew that Israel would break this covenant. He knew that from the foundation of the world. And that's why, even in eternity past, before the world runs, God planned to make a new covenant. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me, yeah. from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Yeah. And did you notice something? God never said the word if. In the new covenant, God promises to forgive the sins of a particular people. He promises to write his law in their hearts. He promises that he will be their God and they will be his people forever. God's not the God of the dead, but of the living. So this new covenant even promises eternal life. And not one promise is contingent on the people's obedience. Not one. Rather, these promises are based solely on the goodness of God, on his free grace extended toward unworthy sinners. You see how much better the new covenant is than the old. Yeah. Now, who are the participants in this new covenant? Who are the people who receive these new covenant promises? 
Well, do you remember what God promised to Abraham in the beginning? God said, tell the stars if thou be able to number them, so shall thy seed be. And Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. You see, God made promises to Abraham about his seed. But those promises pointed forward, not just to a nation, but also to one seed one individual in whom all the families of the earth will be blessed. The seed promised to Abraham spoke of Christ. Amen. It spoke of Jesus Christ who would come. And Abraham believed that. Abraham believed this promise about Christ. And so Abraham became the father, not just of a physical nation by bloodline, but also of a spiritual nation by faith. So that everyone who believes on Christ, everyone who by faith receives Christ, the same are the children of Abraham. And just as the people of the old covenant entered into that covenant by natural birth, they were born into it. So also the people of the new covenant enter into that covenant by spiritual birth. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Ye must be born again. Yeah. You must be born again to participate in the new covenant. And the result, the evidence of this new birth is repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, but God also gave a tangible, visible sign of entrance into this new covenant. Just as God gave Abraham the sign of circumcision to mark off his physical children from the rest of the world, so also God has given now a visible sign to mark off the spiritual children of Abraham. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. John the Baptist. And God sent John to administer this new sign of baptism. Amen. Now, baptism doesn't cause a person to be born again. Be very clear about that. The act of baptism doesn't cause a person to be born again any more than putting on a wedding ring causes one to be married. No, no. Baptism isn't the reality. Baptism is the sign Amen. of the reality. Amen. It's a picture. It's a visible reminder that this person has been born again that he's repented, that he's believed on Christ, and so he is a partaker of the new covenant. You see, baptism is performed only once on every newborn child of God, and it marks off a particular people, distinguishing them from the rest of the world. And it's a reminder to God, and to that child of God, and to all the children of God, and to the whole world, of the new covenant promises God has made in Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And that's why baptism is a sign that pertains only to believers. It's not something that belongs to believers and their infant children. No, no, it belongs only to believers, only to the spiritual children of Abraham. To apply the sign of baptism to an unbelieving infant is a great error because it confounds and confuses who really belongs to the new covenant. You see, the old covenant belonged to a spiritually mixed people, some who were born again, but many who were not. Some who were faithful, but many who were faithless. That's why Paul says, they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. But what does the new covenant say? They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them. So every participant in the new covenant is a believer. They all know me. They all know the Lord. So God caused John the Baptist to be born to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And that's exactly what he did. And then one day, by the grace of God, Jesus was born. And God 
chose Jesus to be the one who would save his people from their sins. Like Moses, a wicked king attempted to kill him as soon as he was born. But Jesus was hidden away, went down into Egypt. And then after the death of Herod, he came back into the land of Israel. And like Moses, God spoke to his people through Jesus. I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say, and what I should speak. And just as Moses was the mediator of the old covenant, now Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. And Jesus taught the people on the mount, just as Moses had. And the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And you know what? Jesus announced the terms of the new covenant. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. You see, the promise of the new covenant is the forgiveness of sin and eternal life for all who will believe on Christ, for all who will receive him. And this redemption is going to be purchased by the blood of Christ. He is going to lay down his life for the sheep. That was his purpose. That was his destiny. And so he entered into Jerusalem for the last time before his death. And he observed the Passover with his disciples. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. You see what Jesus is doing? He's taking the old covenant sign of the Passover and he's reinterpreting it and creating a new sign for the new covenant of the Lord's Supper. The bread symbolizing his broken body. The cup symbolizing his blood shed for sinners. And on this very day, he's going to deliver his people from their sins. Because Jesus is the Passover lamb. Mm -hmm. And God has promised that when I see the blood, I will pass over you. <coughs> Not only that, but Jesus is giving this ordinance of the Lord's Supper to his people for an ongoing memorial this do in remembrance of me. And this would become another visible sign of the promise that God kept when he laid our sins on the Lord Jesus. I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And every time we eat of that bread and every time we drink of that cup, we remember what Christ has done for us. It's a reminder to God and to us and to all the world that Christ shed his blood to save us. And this sign of the Lord's Supper is actually related to the sign of baptism. Again, there's a particular order of the signs that God has specified. Just as circumcision must precede the observance of the Passover, so now must baptism precede the observance of the Lord's Supper. Baptism is a one-time act that marks off a particular people from the rest of the world. And only those who are so marked off are permitted to partake of this feast, which is an ongoing memorial. You remember that God also specified where the Passover was to be observed in each house of the Israelites. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house. We can learn from this, that the Lord's Supper is not to be observed from house to house, nor anywhere outside the house. 
but only within each house that is within each local assembly. All right. And just as Moses sealed the old covenant with the blood of oxen, so now Christ has sealed the new covenant with his own blood. And so the new covenant has been officially ratified by blood. It came into force when Jesus bled and died on the cross. So you see, God has made a binding agreement that by this man, Jesus Christ, all who believe are justified from all things by which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. God has sealed this promise with the blood of his own son. Mm -hmm. And it's a better covenant Amen. with a better mediator and a better priest and a better sacrifice and a better altar with better promises and better conditions. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's it. Simply trusting in him. Simply believing his word. Simply receiving him and looking to him as your personal sin. We beg you to receive him. Turn to the Lord Jesus. Maybe you say, I believe these things are true, but I just don't know if I want to be elect. I don't know if I can trust Christ. I want more than anything in the world for my sins to be forgiven. But I just don't know if I can trust him. Let me tell you this. God commands you to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not an option. You don't have to doubt whether he's willing to receive you. He commands you. God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You don't have to wonder. You can trust him. You can rest on the promises he's made, sealed with his blood in the new covenant, and you will receive the forgiveness of sins. Your iniquities will be remembered no longer. Do not despise the blood that has been shed for sinners. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Amen. Amen. Brother, 